Hi guys, it has turned into a glorious spring day down here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in the heart of Texas after a stormy night here at the end of April 2020. But we are going, oh yes, my name is Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles. And we are going to go all the way up to upstate New York, where I hope to be going physically in a few weeks, where I have the great honor, folks, of, of speaking to a man I admit I was unaware of up until about a month ago, and now he has become my hero. And this is Dr. Sheldon Solomon. You might have uh, seen a glimpse of Sheldon in Planet of the Humans, but just a glimpse Anyone who is not familiar with uh, this man, Sheldon Solomon is professor of psychology at Skidmore College. His studies of the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death on behavior have been supported by the National Science Foundation and the Ernest Becker Foundation and were featured in the award-winning documentary film Flight from Death. The Quest for Immortality. He is co-author of In the Wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror, and more germane to our discussion, The Worm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life. He's received all kinds of awards, too numerous to mention. He received his PhD from the University of Kansas and his research interests at Skidmore are the psychological function of self-esteem and more importantly to what we're going to be talking about effects of human awareness of death on thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Sheldon Solomon, come on to the say hello to the folks at Collapse Chronicles and we're going to dive right into this rousing conversation. Well, hi, everybody, and, and thanks, Sam, for uh, having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so guys, uh, for people who are familiar with me, uh, you, you, might, you might have known that uh, re recently I've almost had two channels here, uh, the, the normal Collapse Chronicles and the, the kind of a side channel what I've been calling the Corona Panic Chronicles. Now, I am going to be coming back later uh, with a second interview for the Collapse Chronicles side of this uh, conversation. That will be a second interview, but we're going to center this conversation on, obviously, the biggest story on the planet. So, uh, Sheldon Solomon, I'm going to read just from the introduction from uh, the book you co-authored, Worm at the Core. Quote, in fact, the fear of death drives us so much that any effort to address the question, what makes people act the way they do, is profoundly inadequate if it does not include the awareness of death as a central factor. So, Sheldon, tell us how the awareness of death is the worm at the core of what is going on uh, with the coronavirus and the reaction to it. Wow. Uh, great question, Sam, and, and kind of a big one, but uh, it's true that the work that I do with uh, my friends and uh, colleagues, Jeff Greenberg and, and Tom Pazinski, going back for 40 years now, um, is based on that relatively simple, albeit unwelcome notion, and we got it from a cultural anthropologist, a guy named Ernest Becker, who in the 1970s uh, wrote a book called The Denial of Death. And Becker's argument is disarmingly simple. It's like, if you want to understand why people do what they do when they do it, uh, then um, we've got to have a big, 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 big picture of what drives human behavior. And 
what he said is if we're going to figure that out, uh, that we got to start with Darwin. And we got to say, well, how are people the same as all other living things and how are we distinctly different? And he's like, well, we're like a lot of other living things in that we're basically predisposed to want to stay alive, not only to survive, but to reproduce. And, and yet we're also, so we're no different in that regard than beavers or barnacles. But on the other hand, uh, we are a lot different. Amongst other things, we've got this massive forebrain, uh, and that allows us to think abstractly and symbolically to the point where we can imagine stuff that doesn't even exist, and then we could make those things real. And that's pretty handy for staying alive, but it also has the unintended consequence of making us aware not only of the fact that we exist, uh, but like all living things, uh, we are smart enough by virtue of our massive forebrain uh, to realize that uh, we are of a finite nature and we too will someday die. All right, not only are we going to die someday, and I hope I'm not the first person to make our listeners cognizant of that <laughs> fact, but we know we can die at any time for reasons that we can't anticipate or control. And then on top of that, just to knee us in the psychological grind, uh, Becker's like, all right, you're going to die someday. You can walk outside and get smoked by a comet or a virus. And um, you're an embodied animal. Uh, like it or not, you're a breathing piece of defecating meat, no more significant or enduring than a lizard or a potato. And what Becker says is that if we were aware of the reality of the human condition, we wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning. And that what we have done as a species in order to manage the existential terror that's engendered by the awareness of our mortality is we embrace what he calls cultural worldviews, uh, humanly constructed belief systems that we share uh, with the people around us uh, that minimize death anxiety by giving us each a sense that we're persons of value um, in a world of meaning. And if you're lucky enough to be able to perceive yourself as a valuable person in a meaningful universe, that's what Becker calls self-esteem. All right, so in a nutshell, Becker's argument is that whether we're aware of it or not, we spend most of our waking moments, and mostly we're not aware of this fact, trying to maintain confidence in our culturally constructed beliefs, as well as confidence in our value as individuals. All right. And so uh, what happens is whenever the psychological shit hits the fan, if you'll pardon the expression, whenever something reminds us of our mortality, maybe you got a, a lump on your chest, maybe you're passing uh, a cemetery, uh, maybe um, that you were unsettled by the events of September 11th. Maybe it has occurred to you that the coronavirus uh, may be fatal, not only to those around you, but to yourself. Uh, we call that mortality salience. And that's just psychobabble for being reminded of the possibility of your own demise. And what Becker argued and what our studies have shown is that when people are reminded of their mortality, uh, they go to extraordinary lengths uh, to blot out the awareness of death, uh, either by doing stuff like Kierkegaard called it tranquilizing ourselves with the trivial, drinking, watching television, shopping, Facebook, Twitter, or uh, that we go to exceptional lengths to uh, double down on our culturally constructed beliefs. And so uh, Americans who are patriotic, they're going to become uh, more patriotic. Uh, people that, um, that see themselves, uh, maybe you see yourself as a great athlete. Well, then you're going to want to be an even greater athlete. All right, so back to your original question, Sam, and that's, well, what is going to happen in light of our present moment? Well, our argument is that it's probably fairly obvious to almost everybody on Earth that this is a potentially uh, turbulent time. 
And so we see almost everybody in a state of chronically high mortality salience. And so we would expect to see the same kinds of reactions to the virus that uh, were widely observed in the aftermath of September 11th. Can, can, I, can, can I just interject here? I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not about to get, get in a debate with Sheldon Solomon, guys. Okay, don't, don't think for one minute. I just, this is just getting clarification. I am not debating this man. It seems to me that, that this, what's going on here, even it, it leaves 9-11 in, in the dust, brother. Uh, you, you mentioned, okay, you, you, you mentioned in passing a minute ago, and this comes up time and time again in other things you have written, in other interviews you've had, about, you know, like subliminally giving death uh, anxiety messages or, you know, very subtle, subliminal, just barely planting the seed in, in, a, in a few people's heads. Sheldon, I, I think you've noticed, uh, surely, uh, that what we are witnessing is an entire planet of almost 8 billion people having hammered into their heads 24-7 from the moment they uh, awake uh, to the moment they go to bed. Every moment in between it is completely devoted to death anxiety. This yeah, is the single actually, biggest pummeling of death anxiety. This yeah, has yeah, yeah. To, Point taken, and we're yeah. not in a debate, but I, I uh, stand corrected on that front because 9-11 was transformative. Uh, and yet, uh, yeah, this is 9-11 on steroids. It's <laughs> like somebody, you know, dropped uh, a, a universe-sized crane uh, on top of the planet. And I, I think you're right uh, in two ways, Sam. One is, is just the magnitude of the potential danger to the inhabitants of Earth. And then I think that something else that you mentioned, and it's important, and that is that uh, you know, uh, after 9-11, you know, there were smartphones and stuff, but people weren't plugged into a 24-hour continuous stream of information and misinformation. And I think what that does is to uh, take uh, a, a fairly substantial amount of death anxiety that we would have anyway in response to the virus and ensure that it's magnified yeah. and persistent. Yeah, point. good point. I mean, this must be a wet dream for someone like you, brother. Uh, so, so, someone look, looking at, at, at uh, death, anxiety, arousal uh, on a on a population. Uh, yeah. uh, my God, you will. This must be the opportunity of a lifetime for the few people doing what you do. I mean, how are you ever going to wade through? Uh, the the amount of research that must be pouring uh, into you. Where do you even start disentangling what this uh, what this means psychologically to an entire planet who's in fear right now? Yeah, uh, we're in uh, yeah we're in new terrain, and uh, I think it's uh, not to uh, hide behind. Um, a pretense of being a scientist, but it will be interesting. We we don't know uh, what chronic and persistently high levels of death anxiety will do. I mean, I I can piss in the wind and predict that there's going to be a large chunk of humanity uh, that will have the psychological equivalent of PTSD, and uh, they may never come out of it. And uh, there may be other folks that are, um, may, there's a phenomenon in psychology called post-traumatic growth. There might be another chunk of humanity uh, that, you know, comes out of this um, um, enlivened and uplifted. Uh, you know, I think it was Nietzsche who said, uh, you know, sometimes it takes catastrophe to reduce us to psychic and physical rubble from which we're able to reconstruct ourselves and revalue all values. And so for me, maybe just to stay sane, uh, um, painfully aware 
uh, the death anxiety. Um, it, 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 Ron Amok uh, uh, can bring out the worst in us, but I also sincerely hope that it might, for some of us, bring out the best in us. Well, this is what I, I want to get your comment on. I, with, with my, I mean, the interviews that I've had with other people over the past month, and, and of course in my own reading and listening to you know to other interviews uh, with, with people, I, I, I see uh, there's so many ways to divide the camps. But one way we have what I call the uh, singing kumbaya moment that the people are, are, are talking about how what this is doing is bringing the global community together to fight this common, this common enemy that, you know, this is the first time we've had an enemy that, that you know, affects everyone from Prince Charles to, uh, you know, some old lady in a mud hut in Bangladesh. Uh, wait, so this is a come together, uh, work together, uh, uni unifying moment. And then uh, these people are probably m more representative people like me who see Mad Max forming. I see the single biggest uh, sale of guns. I'm sure you, you're aware of this, that more guns and ammunition were sold in the United States of America in March 2020 than in history. Yeah. What do you, how do you uh, look at these two camps, and do, which one, uh, is it going to be Mad Max or Kumbaya coming out of this? So, yeah, wow. Well, um, awesome question, Sam. And, I, and at the risk of sounding silly, you know, when I get a great question, I'm like, look, if I could answer that, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut on a beach with my Nobel Prize, because uh, th that, I don't know what... I can't think of a more important question. You know, it, it definitely, I don't think it's overly hysterical to see where we're now at as a fork in the road of sorts. And, um, all right, now, at the risk of sounding two-faced, I would lo I love the Kumbaya thing. Um, <laughs> and for people who read, um, there was an op-ed in the Washington Post a couple of days ago by the King of Jordan, and... It, it was a wonderful piece where he said, look, uh, you know, this is shattering the global uh, institutional, economic and political infrastructure. And uh, why not use this opportunity to kind of reconstruct it in a sustainable fashion? And what he argues, moreover, is that, you know, for that to happen, uh, we're going to have to overcome our deep-seated uh, tribal affiliations and recognize that all human beings have more in common than we are different because it's only if we identify all humans as part of our tribe uh, that we're going to stop uh, just summarily in hating and killing people because they're different. All right, so... Um, that's that's the kumbaya thing. I watch Lion King. I, I love those <laughs> films. Um, uh, but um, uh, Mad Max strikes me as the more likely direction, at least in the immediate future. Uh, uh, the same thing happened, um, you know, after 9-11. But you're right, it's happening even more. So when we were asked to write our book about 9-11... Um, we didn't know anything about terrorism, and ignorance is fine sometimes because we had to just go and learn what was happening. And, yeah, sure enough, right after 9-11, gambling goes way up, alcohol consumption way up, gun sales uh, way up, ethnocentrism and hate crimes uh, way up, selfish exploitation of other people in the service of maximizing personal gain uh, way up. And so uh, most of our work um, would suggest that, um, that we could expect to see um, amplification of almost every unsavory human quality on top of magnification of every pre-existing psychological condition. So 
Um, people are going to get more hateful and distrustful of folks who are different. Uh, and uh, any um, pre-existing uh, condition is going to be amplified. And this is probably common sense masquerading as psychological insight. But people with anxiety disorders are going to have more of them. Uh, OCD people should buy a shit ton of soap. Uh, socially anxious people uh, are going to start hiding in closets and so on and so forth. So I fear and I would love to be wrong uh, that... Uh, the Mad Max direction is where we're headed for the moment. Well, we certainly see, uh, it, it, at least on the nation-state level, uh, a, a pulling back from international uh, cooperation. I mean, locking borders, shutting down airports, uh, and, and and then, of course, I, I mean, the, the big question to to me. What, what I think is going to be Mad Max, whether it's the coronavirus or the next coronavirus, that, you know, coming next year, uh, that we're in a perpetual state from this point forward, uh, is, is when the food, is when the food chains start breaking, and we're already seeing that when people Absolutely. when people start getting hungry, whether it's coronavirus, at some point. Sheldon, we are going to run up against something, whether it's this one or the next one, and people are going to start hoarding their food, which we're already seeing at a national level. That, yeah. it, when people get hungry, Mad Max is here. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm a big Bob Marley fan, and, and uh, I can't remember which tune, but uh, anyway, he's like, a hungry man is an angry man, and that's right. Yeah, it's... Uh... Do you think? Do you think there's? I mean, just, I mean, this is out of your area of expertise, but I, I, I seem to to see all like everything else in this debate. But I see some people who have pretty good source credibility in my journalism book. I am a that, that I am my training a journalist. I, I see more and more credible sources saying that uh, th that if if things don't change here pre pretty soon, that we are going to be looking at food supply chains starting to break down, and uh, we we will see where that goes. Do you, so you're, you're you're not eliminating. No, not at all. Uh, you know, again, uh, without any um, expertise, and so um, I'm just speaking as an interested, semi-literate dilettante, but just the, uh, the closure of the major meatpacking yeah. uh, entities in the U.S. does not bode well, uh, even for the summer. And then the, the difficulties... Uh, as I understand, not only in the U.S., but in Europe, where uh, large chunks of the folks who harvest crops are migrant laborers, and they're having trouble moving yeah. across borders. So, um, you know, that, I mean, I, I, I'm going to sound silly here, but, you know, 40 years ago when I started at Skidmore in my first course, uh, it was a, a course in applied social psychology and I you know I made this little poster and I was like if you like being alive you should buy a bicycle and start learning how to grow food um, and um, I should have listened to my own advice back <laughs> in the day uh, I have a bicycle but it was only a year or two ago that I started planting fruit trees in our backyard. So if I could make it another year or two, if anybody's hungry, come over to my house for a plum or a peach. But um, I, I foresee, um, and some of your listeners, you know, may be familiar with Wendell Berry's work oh, um, yeah. over the years. And, uh, you know, he was wise in the 1970s, even more wise now um, when uh, he advised everybody, no matter what our uh, respective circumstances are, um, we need to, as quickly as possible, uh, you know, acquire an appreciation of our local ecologies and intersect respectfully uh, with physical reality in the service of, um, you know, much uh, more scalable and sustainable communities. I think the days 
of having a strawberry in December in upstate New York that got <laughs> trucked in from Mexico, those days are going to be gone soon. Uh, yeah, I think they might already be. I want to, uh, you, you have run this quote from George Bernard Shaw, uh, and, and uh, I'm. this is coming from your essay, uh, uh, death, Anxiety, and the Anthropocene. Was that a chapter of The Worm at the Core? Yeah, so uh, uh, the truth be told, Sam, the, uh, the death denial on the Anthropocene um, is literally, um, it, it's kind of a synopsis of The Worm at the Core that yeah. I, uh, I was asked to do a short essay that took the ideas from our, our longer book yeah, and okay. framed them in terms of uh, what might be up. And uh, so a lot of the quotes are, are in both pieces. The George Bernard Shaw thing comes from one of his plays. I think it's Heartbreak House. Give and, us the quote and how, what was he prophesizing uh, the coronavirus? Tell us the quote and draw, connect the dots between what he was talking about and what we're seeing. Yeah, well, the, the quote, planet is, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, it's when the angel of death sounds his trumpet, the pretenses of civilization are blown from men's heads into the mud like hats in a gust of wind. Was that, that pretty close? That, well, you, you nailed it, brother. You said, right, you so, said it so many times that, uh, that it rolled yeah, right because, off your golden tongue. Well, because I think here's Shaw uh, around World War I, um, uh, you know, just pointing out uh, how much uh, of our hostility and disdain uh, towards people who are different is driven by death anxiety. Uh, and this was one of our original interests and one of Becker's interests. So he wrote a book called Escape from Evil. And in that book, he said, look, most of the evil in the world is caused by people who say they're going to rid the world of evil. And his point is, is that um, that one of the reasons why uh, humans are are almost congenitally incapable of living peacefully with other folks who don't share our beliefs about reality is that if our culturally constructed belief systems if their function is to minimize death anxiety, and by the way, Becker's not claiming that that's the only function of culture. He's just saying that we need to consider the death denying aspects of it. All right, but his point is, is if my beliefs serve to reduce death anxiety, then I have a problem whenever I run into people who have different beliefs. And so I believe God created the earth in six days. Uh, the Borneo and the South Pacific, they believe the earth was created out of a giant coconut. And, and, and so, but if they're right, then I've got to be wrong. And the, the disarming point is that the very existence of people who are different uh, makes us, whether we're aware of it or not, prone to experiencing death anxiety when we encounter them. And so in response, what we tend to do is to denigrate, to belittle and dehumanize people who are different. And then we try to coerce them uh, into disposing of their ideas and adopting ours instead. Uh, and if that doesn't work, we just kill him, uh, thus demonstrating that our God is superior after all. And so we've done dozens and other people have done dozens of experiments uh, uh, where we show that when you remind people of death, Christians love Christians more and they hate Jewish people. In Israel, Jews love Jews more and they hate Christians and Arabs, Germans reminded of death, literally sit closer to people who look like they're German and further away from people who look like Turkish immigrants. Iranians reminded of death are, are more eager to become suicide bombers. Uh, Americans reminded of death are more eager to use nuclear and chemical weapons on countries that uh, are not currently threatening us. 
All right, and so, um, sure enough, in the aftermath of September 11th, hatred of other people goes sky high. Ditto for the coronavirus. It didn't take long uh, before uh, hate crimes were way up. Uh, some of them uh, were directed at Asian people yeah, trying yeah. to have... Uh, trying to attribute the cause of the virus. And this is very, very common uh, historically, is that, uh, you know, we have to explain anything that happens that's bad. And uh, it, it's easier if we can anthropomorphize our difficulties and ascribe them uh, to a particular individual or group of individuals. Um, and and there... And, I'm not saying that we ought blame the Chinese for any of this, even though we know that the virus originated there. But the point that I want to make that the evolutionary psychologists make is that, you know, historically, part of our, uh, our, our, our adverse or negative reaction to strangers may have been in the service of maintaining social distance to ward off infection. You know, after all, for most of human history, we lived in these little tiny communities. And if uh, if somebody came from uh, another one, well, they were often bearing um, uh, dangerous uh, infections that could wipe mm -hmm. out entire populations. And so there is a biological basis for our being somewhat reticent around people who are different. But uh, that basic the uh, um, uh, affectation it is magnified substantially when intimations of mortality are on our mind. And so, um, yeah, the virus has uh, made us more hateful, uh, more ethnocentric, uh, more devoted, for example, to building a big wall to keep out the immigrants as if that could block the virus. This has nothing to do with the merits of immigration. This is just the idea that uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, death, anxiety induced hostility to people who are different. Okay, so now I want to, as, as my growing list of enemies and detractors, uh, both in, in this little rabbit hole I, I call the Doomosphere and elsewhere. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about myself. Imagine that the old narcissist is going to talk about himself for a minute. Now, I, you are completely unaware of this, Sheldon. I don't even know how many people here listening to this know that I have another YouTube channel where what I have been doing for the past week, for the past about three weeks, is having is having some sick twisted fun as my alter ego, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so what I have been doing is trying to throw back in the face of the haters that I it's, that, that that I am seeing like over here on this tame channel that that I'm putting it on steroids, trying to make a a you know a joke, trying to bring some humor, but of course nobody is getting my, my, uh, my humor. But anyway, what, what I'm talking about here is even over here at Collapse Chronicles, uh, the, the level of, just cause I have dared to go up against the dominant paradigm. I, uh, I just mildly over here have questioned what I call the fear stream uh, dominant paradigm uh, on here, and I have made it clear that I think the economic uh, that I think the economic knock-on effects are ultimately going to do more damage to both uh, you know to humanity and more importantly the planet than the actual the actual threat, physical threat of, of catching this virus. And it is unbelievable, the level. I have lost hundreds of subscribers uh, on, on this channel. People have ripped down their financial support of me. I have lost a very close friend uh, in my, quote, real life here in Austin, Texas, 
the friendship has been destroyed. My relationship with my sister is somewhat on the ropes right now. Unbelievable level, uh, I mean, over-the-top animosity that I have never experienced from climate change deniers, from chemtrail wackos, right. from, from both sides of the 9-11 fence, because I'm on the fence, people on both sides of the 9-11 fence take me. Yep. But you know, hear what I'm saying? This, what is it, Sheldon, about this subject that has raised the level of just sheer hatred towards yeah. anybody that dares question the, the mainstream uh uh, the you know the mainstream conversation. Wow! What so Sam, I, it, in in my view, it comes down to um, your non-adversarial correction of my equation of what's going on now with nine eleven. So I was like, oh, you know, nine eleven uh, was catastrophic, and we saw all these effects. And then you said respectfully, nah, you know what? Uh, the the Corona scene uh, is uh, orders of magnitude yeah. more profound in terms of existential crisis, and I I think that's what's happening. Uh, uh, you know, so here we have uh, certainly anyone who's alive right now. Uh, this is the most tenuous moment in human history where life and death is literally at stake. Uh, And if we extrapolate from that uh, and if we acknowledge for a moment that uh, most of our beliefs are thinly veiled efforts to minimize death anxiety, uh, then uh, how could it be otherwise? Uh, You know, so if you express an opinion that's at odds uh, with a deeply held belief in a moment of crisis, um, you know, that that's like the piss Christ. I don't know if you know the artist that did put the crucifix in a bowl of urine and uh, it's Maplethorpe and uh, <laughs> religious people didn't care for it. No, but, they didn't. But, <laughs> but you're basically, you know, you're you're taking a position uh, that undermines uh, a, 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 an incredibly central tenet uh, for some individuals. Uh, and um, you know, I, my view, and we were chatting a bit about this before we started the program, is that uh, I'm agnostic on these matters because I don't pretend to have the skills to be able to judge. What I would say, though, is that there uh, are legitimate arguments that could be made on behalf of your perspective. And... and that, you know, rather than um, rather than, you know, unsubscribe and, um, and um, you know, defriend you or whatever they call it these days. Um, how about I, at the risk of, of sounding um, like I'm yearning for the good old days that never were. Uh, but, you know, what about the old days where people of goodwill could have honest disagreements about important issues in the service of advancing our understanding of anything? You know, so um, if we lived in a Walt disney light universe where uh, we had leaders in our country and other countries that were amenable to facts and reason, uh, we could surely design uh, some ways of studying reactions to the pandemic in localized areas that would give us some insight about what might work best, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, this, as I say, I, I, I mean, for, for years I have been advocating, Sheldon, I mean, so you, you don't know me from Adam, uh, I have been advocating, you know, jokingly on some places here, and, and perfectly seriously, uh, here on uh, Collapse Chronicles, I have been advocating for, you know, overthrowing global industrial civilization. I have been advocating for the, the extinction of the human race. I fully support the <laughs> extinction of the human race. I think we, all, we are the virus on this planet. So, but I can go on here. I can talk about 
uh, I, I think humans need to be extinct. We are scum. We need to go. We yeah. need to get rid of global industrial civilization. I can yeah. do thousands of those videos. YouTube will not pull one of them. I have had two of my YouTubes pulled uh, just in the past week alone. And it, it, it's a whole different level. There is no discourse. It is a mud slinging. You are you are either for us, you're first or you're against. Uh, yeah, it, it, oh, it, the, the line it, it, even more than nine eleven, even more than climate change debate, even more than the chemtrail debate or whatever. This is the single most divisive issue that I have ever uncovered. And yeah. it's just been absolutely shocking to me. Um, yeah, well, again, I would have said shocking too, except now that we're talking about it in light of your previous point, Sam, which is never has there been an in-your-face um, surrounded by death moment for people who are currently alive. And I think that's the big difference. Like, you know, if I'm hanging out watching you talking about it'd be great if humans were extinct, and I happen to agree with you, you know, but meanwhile, I'm still getting shit from Amazon.com and uh, Taco Bell still open. And so it's not, it's just a thought exercise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, th this is, uh, this is not. You know, this is like the Matrix, but it's live. It is. We are. We are in the. Uh, I call it the Twilight Zone. We we are truly, truly in in the Twilight Zone. And so, one one, one more thing about uh, since I'm talking, it's kind of like I'm talking to my shrink here, guys, because I love this man because he he, he did more to answer my uh, my question about uh, about this than anyone I've ever found. So, Sheldon, I honestly don't believe I have a fear of my own death. I have maybe through massive intake of, of hallucinogenic uh, uh, plant guides, you know, being friends with Terrence McKenna and yep. Don Juan Matus, whatever, but I've never really suffered it. And, and, and I think... Part of what it was with me, and, and I'm thinking, or other people who are on in, in the camp with me, is that it's not so much a political divide between right and left and Trump tards versus whatever. All of this, they're trying to force a political square nut uh, into a round hole, which isn't there. What it is. Either you, you, you have death anxiety and you don't. And people who don't suffer from the level of death, I, I just did not realize that death anxiety, since it's not, a, since it doesn't concern me in my own life, and I'm thinking I'm speaking for a lot of people, uh, and, and I'm just throwing it out here for your comment, do you think the divide that we could be seeing is not between the right and the left, uh, I'm very left, and, and and I despise Donald Trump, but I am 100% want these lockdowns to end. Do you think what we could be seeing is the divide between people who do not have death anxiety uh, to the degree of the of the majority of the population that we are the ones who are the, who are going to be the first to stray from the herd or Am I just patting myself on the back too much here, Sheldon? Oh, uh, unclear, but you make some, or unclear in my estimation, Sam, but you make some, I think, very fine and important points. And so um, uh, I'll risk the ire of some of your listeners, just like I do um, when I'm at Skidmore, because I, <laughs> or wherever I talk, I'm like, look, I'm happy to annoy all of you. One of my fortune cookie like statements is left and right are both beside the point and there you uh, go. just like you say i um I'm, I'm with you on that i'm not suggesting that there aren't differences and uh, i tend to lean uh, left uh, also um you know but uh, also you know my not to get political but I, what i tell my friends on the left and the right um, is they should 
uh, take the time uh, to actually read the people that they purport to be influenced by. Um, yeah. it, you know, so but that's a story for another time, because like Adam Smith would be a Democratic Socialist if he were here today. And um, <laughs> a lot of my conservative friends don't even know what it means to be conservative in terms of a political philosophy. Uh, ditto for the liberal types. All right. Be that as it may. All right. So that shifts the question. Another high dollar question. Is, is it death anxiety or, or not? And. Here, I, I could see it in a number of ways. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to date myself uh, chronologically and culturally. So I'm a throwback to the old days. I'm 66 years old, uh, gobbled um, every hallucinogen on the planet. Uh, don't know Terrence McKenna personally, but I'm certainly familiar with his work. And um, I think that. Um, and my readings uh, about the, the people who have had experiences with hallucinogens, I don't know if you're familiar with the Stanislav Grof dude. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. all of them talk about um, uh, the prospect of coming to terms with one's mortality in the context of those kinds of drug experiences. It's not that you have to gobble drugs to do that. Uh, but it is one uh, favorable outcome. So one possibility is that um, that that it's high versus low or no death anxiety. Another possibility, and we write about this in our book, is that it's uh, there. People may have death anxiety to varying degrees. And what may matter ultimately is what you do with that anxiety. Um, our argument is that if you if you deny that you're having it, and if to use the psycho babble, if you repress death anxiety, uh, then it often comes back to bear malignant fruit. On the other hand, because basically here you are, you're, you know, you, you, you got 12,000 Facebook friends, you're drinking a 30 pack of crappy beer, spraying cheese whiz on a cracker, hating somebody because they look different. And you have no idea that those are malignant manifestations of repressed death anxiety. But it, it could be that what's up is that it's not how much death anxiety you have. Uh, but whether or not you're willing to admit it, and if so, if you are experiencing it, uh, to have the, the courage and the favorable conditions that enable you to tackle it head on rather than trying to brush it in, into the back of your psychological landscape. Well, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Sheldon, that, that people who I claim are suffering from death anxiety vehemently deny it to me. Vehemently. That's right. Nobody, is, especially a man, uh, is going to admit to another man claiming I don't have death anxiety. What, what do you think? Do you think that, that a man, you know what I'm saying? That they're not going to it. They're, they're not going to admit to it. And I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of comments that I have death anxiety. Uh, anyway, so Sheldon, we just, uh, good Lord, we are already at 48 minutes and I still want to come back for another conversation, but uh, obviously th this, this, what's going on with this coronavirus, this will not be the last one of these that we see in the 21st century. Uh, we're, and we're going to talk about this more in our second discussion, but I want to touch on it at the end of this one. Uh, do you think uh, that this, what, what we're seeing uh, ramping up just in the past few weeks is going to, at least psychologically speaking, it, it, is this the, new psycholo the psychological new normal for the rest of the 21st century? Are we going to be kept in a constant state of death, anxiety, arousal from here on out as more and more of this stuff becomes apparent? Oh, I desperately hope to be wrong, and my gut tells me that you're right, that we're at the... Uh, I was watching some news program today saying a lot of... You know, somebody made like a baseball metaphor saying, 
oh, everybody thinks we're at the end of this, but we're <laughs> in the second inning of yeah. the ball game. This is just starting. Yeah. And what does that mean? What does that mean for a, 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 a five-year-old? Uh, like I know a five-year-old in my life. Uh, what, what's that going to do? To you know, to the five-year-olds and the two-year-olds growing up in this, what what kind of people are? What kind of generation are, are we raising here? I, I mean, th th these are some big, big questions. That yeah, people don't and you talk know, about. Uh, you said Twilight Zone earlier, and I don't know how many of the listeners are old enough to know what you're talking about, but we're in Twilight <laughs> Zone territory. I could see an entire generation of people in a relatively dissociated state uh, with antisocial tendencies by virtue of the necessity of maintaining social distance. It's, it, it's uh, crazy times on the planet. Well, anyway, Sheldon Solomon, this, as I say, guys, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring uh, Sheldon back on for part two, this, where this is going to be our segue right here we're, we're going to leave off here with part one and when we come back whether it's in, in an hour from now or tomorrow or whatever we're going to pick up from here guys and start looking at at the, the bigger picture we're going to leave the corona scene and we're going to go into the anthropocene and and start looking at at some other things and uh, and, and, and what I think is the bigger story on the planet. But Sheldon Solomon, uh, we, you know, stick around after we hang up while we figure out what to do about part two. But uh, for, this, for this interview, guys, uh, this is Sam Mitchell at either Corona Panic Chronicles or Collapse Chronicles saying uh, thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed what Sheldon had to say, please thumb up this video. And you might as well uh, sub subscribe over here to help me build up my numbers again. And maybe I'll see you back here again uh, in two or three months after this craziness blows over. But Sheldon Solomon, we really, really appreciate you spending 50 minutes uh, talking about this with us clueless morons. And more importantly, we really appreciate the hard work you have been doing. And keep up the good fight, brother. Well, I'll try. Uh, thanks for having me, Sam. All right, so stick around here, but I need to say bye, guys.